Hello students, in this video we'll discuss the Euler-Lagrange equations. Let's consider two points in the plane P1 and P2 and then all curves that connect P1 and P2. We can parameterize those curves as x of t, y of t, x of t, y of t, where t goes between a and b. And by reparameterization, I can assume that t goes between a and b. Then what I want to do is let's let f be a smooth function. Technically, we just need two continuous derivatives of five variables. and our goal is to consider and consider the action. And so what is the action? The action is this expression i, and this is a function i that depends on the x and y that you're given. And this is going to be the integral from a to b of some function f over here, f of t x of t, y of t, x prime of t, and y prime of t, dt. So f is a function of five variables. It depends on time. It depends on time, the position, and the velocity, right? And my goal is to minimize this functional, this action functional i, right? So our goal in the Euler problem, so our goal is to minimize this functional i over all curves connecting p1 and p2. And we're going to assume these curves are smooth too, just to make the light my life a little bit easier, right? All right, so that's my objective. And so here's, of course, the classic trick behind all this. The trick is to do the following. What we're going to do is we're going to consider a perturbation of a curve x of t, y of t that goes through the p1 and p2. So let's think of it like this. So I'm going to do is here's my x-axis, here's my y-axis. Let's say here's p1 and here's p2. And so I'm going to look at, from, I'll look at a given curve over here. So that's a given curve x of t, y of t that goes through the points p1, p2. Easy enough. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a perturbation of those things. So then I'm going to take a little small, tiny perturbation like that, okay? And how am I going to construct this perturbation? So I'm going to find functions, so find functions alpha and beta, mapping a, b into r, with alpha of a equals alpha of b equals beta of a equals beta of b is equal to zero. So these functions are at the, at the end points map zero to zero. So then if we consider these curves over here, if I look at x of t plus epsilon alpha of t, and then y of t plus epsilon beta of t is also a curve, is also a curve um, connecting p1 and p2, right? Connecting p1 and p2. Okay, now here comes the calculus part of this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to minimize this functional over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace x and y with x plus epsilon alpha and y with y plus epsilon beta, right? So now if we look at that perturbation, I'm going to consider this function phi, phi of epsilon. It's the integral from a to b of f of t and then x plus epsilon, and I'm going to suppress the of t, right? So this is really a function of t over here, y plus epsilon beta, and then x prime plus epsilon alpha prime, and then y prime plus epsilon beta prime, like that, okay? There's my curve, dt. And now I want to find this where this is minimized. So to find out where this expression is minimized relative to epsilon, I have to find the value of epsilon, which makes phi prime of epsilon equal to zero. So our goal now, our goal is to set the, find the derivative and set it equal to zero, right? So we want phi prime of epsilon 
to be equal to zero, right? And that would minimize this over all curves, over all perturbations of this curve, right? And then also we want the second derivative to be what? We want the second derivative to be um, positive, so you're actually the minimum, right? Okay. So that's our first goal. And so let's do that. So what is phi prime of epsilon? So phi prime of epsilon is equal to the integral from a to b by putting the derivative of epsilon inside the integral. So I can interchange the, since f is smooth, I can input, and this interval over here is compact, I can pass the derivative inside the integral, okay? All right, and so of course there's no epsilon dependence on the first lot over here. What's the epsilon dependence over here? The epsilon dependence over here is f of x, alpha f, x, and of course, this function f is really a function of what? This is a function of t, x, y, x prime, and y prime, and typically you call these x prime and y primes p and q, just for a classic notation, right? And then we have a what? Then the next word where we see an epsilon is in this slot over here, so it's going to be a beta, f, y, right? And then plus what? And then plus, how does this depend on epsilon? It's going to be an alpha prime, f, x dot, I'm gonna call that, well, let's just leave it as x prime over there. It's the derivative of f with respect to this x prime slot, and then plus beta prime, f prime y, and then all this, and of course, all these things are evaluated where? They're all evaluated at this point, t x plus al epsilon alpha, y plus epsilon beta, x prime plus epsilon alpha prime, y prime plus epsilon beta prime, dt. So you might say, well, wait a minute, there's no, there's no t's here. Well, the t is embedded in all of these terms over here. I've just sort of suppressed the function notation, so I didn't have to write down this whole expression. So I'd have to take this whole expression over here inside parentheses and write it where? Write it here, write it here, write it here, and write it here. And that would be a tremendously long expression. So I'm taking this, wherever you see the dot over here, wherever you see that dot, that dot, of course, corresponds to what? That dot corresponds to plugging in that expression over there and all of these things. And if I, I even further simplify this because this x is really what? Is really a function of t, that alpha is really a function of t, that y is a function of t, that beta is a function of t, that x prime is a function of t, the alpha prime is a function of t, the y prime is a function of t, the beta prime is a function of t, right? So in other words, I have a lot of things I need to write, and I'm just suppressing them in this notation over here so we can get the general idea of how these Euler-Lagrange equations are formulated. Okay, excellent. And so now the beautiful thing is that let's recall what happens when you integrate by parts. When you integrate by parts, you can pass the derivative from one function to another function with respect to time, and you plug in the boundary points, right? So let's do that. So now we're going to integrate by parts. And this is the main sort of point of this. So integrate this by parts. And so let's think of what's going to happen when we integrate by parts. We're going to have alpha of t alpha, and then the time derivative of f of x prime, like that, right? And we're going to have what? We're not going to integrate these terms by part. We're going to keep these the same. Keep these the same, so keep these. And then we're going to integrate these by parts. Okay? And we'll have a beta d by dt of f of y prime, like so. And then what will the boundary terms be? When, the when we do the boundary terms, the boundary terms are gonna have an alpha and a beta evaluated from a to b. But we know that alpha and beta evaluated a and b are zero, so the boundary terms are going to vanish. So the boundary terms are gonna vanish. That's because alpha of a is equal to alpha of b is equal to beta of a is equal to beta of b, and all those expressions are equal to zero. Great. And so now if we do that, what do we get? Then we get phi prime of epsilon. Phi prime of epsilon is going to be equal to the integral from a to b. Now we have some terms that have an alpha in them. They're going to be alpha terms and then times f of x, and then minus, minus what? Um, minus the time derivative, minus the time derivative of fx prime, like that, plus beta, uh, what, fy, fy, and then minus d by dt of f of y prime dt is equal to zero, okay? And now at the point epsilon equals zero, I would like this to be equal to zero. So we would plug in epsilon equals zero to this formula. What will happen? I'll just be at x, y, x prime, y prime. And so that will be equal to zero. So phi prime will be equal to zero. 
if and only if what? If and only if. Well, this has to be true for all alpha, all smooth functions alpha and all smooth functions beta. So if we choose beta to be equal to zero, so if we choose beta to be equal to zero, beta to be equal to zero, that's one version of a perturbation, beta equals zero, will imply what? That will imply fx minus d by dt of fx prime is equal to zero, right? And if alpha is equal to zero, that's another version of the curve we can choose, right? That would say that fy minus d by dt of fy prime is equal to zero. And these equations over here are the Euler-Lagrange equations, okay? So these are called the Euler-Lagrange equations. And they will tell me when I have minimized this. Now, of course, you have to check the second derivative condition as well. The second derivative condition is actually also very easy to check. You should do this. You're going to see you get alpha squares and beta squares. And so, like, the sign will be preserved by this. And so, you're going to actually get some positivity in the second derivative when you do this calculation. All right. And so, that's these are the Euler Grange equations. Beautiful. And so, that's the basic part of the calculus of variations. So let me give you a simple example of this. And of course, you might say, well, is this just true for just x and y curve in the plane? This actually can, is true, and we'll see this in further videos when we talk about the geodesic equations, that this is actually true for curves in Rn. So I can look at x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, da, 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 xn. And the only modification that will happen over here is to be f sub xi minus d by dt of f prime of xi is equal to zero for every sort of component of the curve. So this gives us different components of the curves. All right, so what's our classic example of this? Our classic example, look at the integral from a to b of the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt is equal to zero. That's just my arc length interval, right? Arc length. And so how do you minimize the arc length between two points P1 and P2? If I wanted to minimize the arc length between P1 and P2 in the Euclidean space, that's just the Euclidean distance between two points P1 and P2, right, over a curve. I would minimize that by looking at a straight line. All right, well, let's look at these Euler-Grange equations. There's no x dependence on this function over here. This is my function inside the, this square root over here. And so what would my Euler-Grange equations be? They'd be negative d by dt of what? Of the derivative of this thing with respect to x. So that would be a what? That would be a negative, well, not negative, it's just gonna be a d by dx over the square root of d by dx squared plus d by dy squared. Like that, right? That's the derivative with respect to d by dx. It's just a square root. And so that has to be equal to zero, right? And of course, that just says the second derivative of x is equal to zero, right? Because of course, this is a this expression over here um, will force d by dx to be equal to zero, right? So in other words, I can change the coordinates actually to make this just squares, and so this is going to force x to be a linear function. And the same thing with the y, right? So it's going to be the same thing over at d by dt, and I'm going to replace this with just a p now, right? So that's going to be a p or a q, right, over the square root of p squared plus q squared. Now I'm just using the other notation over there, equals zero, where I'm calling this thing over here a p and this thing over here a q, right? And those are, of course, our functions of t, and that's gonna force y to be linear as well, right? So both x and y are linear functions, so if your curve comprises of two linear functions, that curve represents a line between p1 and p2. So we've just seen that real briefly, of course. Of course, this takes a little more, I mean, I have to do a little more work with the chain rule and with derivatives, but that you can actually see very easily that these things force p and q to be linear functions, right? And so if the, derivative, if the derivatives are linear, then uh, if the derivatives are constant, then the functions have to be linear, and that gives you the fact that a straight line is the optimal way, the way to minimize the distance between P1 and P2 via a curve's arc length. So the, and these Euler-Grange equations work in a variety of different contexts, and so as we choose different measures of length, different um, Riemannian metrics, we'll see how we can write down the geodesic equations and find the ways to minimize the distance between points P1 and P2 on arbitrary surfaces. Thank you very much.